so why why this topic? Well, I suppose when we engage with any supplier, the, the kind of quality and integrity of what they supply is is, is important, is, is kind of utmost, isn't it? So um, and and obviously what they supply can also have a knock on effect on our own customers, either because it causes delays because it's not at the right quality or because we use things that are not of the right quality and then it, it then has a, a knock on effect. Um, and, and then that can also, you know, as well as having quality issues, we can have product liability issues of our, our own. And, and the challenge for all organisations in this space is, is really how to put in place controls, processes that are proportionate and appropriate uh, to ensure that we get that right quality consistently. Um, so to help us understand all of that, uh, Namde Ahuchugu is going to lead us through the session today. Uh, for those of you that haven't uh, attended any previous sessions uh, or met Namde yet, Namde works for Zurich Resilience Solutions as a supply chain expert uh, and uh, he works with uh, our customers on supply chain and supply chain management issues um, and, uh, and has almost 20 years of experience uh, in industry as a supply chain and procurement professional. So really dealing with these kind of product issues, product quality, integrity issues on a on a day to day basis um, as a as a constant source of pain, no doubt over about 20 years. Um, so I'll hand over to Namde to lead us through the session. Thank you very much, uh, Alan, um, and uh, welcome and good day to to everybody on the on the call. Um, and just before I move on, Alan, you are you are absolutely right. Supply chain is a very challenging occupation and uh, full of pain and heartache, but uh, it's not for the faint hearted, but you know, you've got to um, you've got to knuckle down when you're in supply chain. I must uh, I must say that. But uh, but yeah, moving on to the, for the, to the topic of today. So it's product liability, integrity and supplier quality assurance. Um, this is the fourth in our in our series of supply chain webinars, um, as Alan mentioned. Uh, you're most welcome to uh, to the session. Um, we're going to we're going to sort of start off the session um, as we've done with previous sessions. We've tried to make it a little bit interactive. Um, we get um, get the thought process going um, with the attendees. Um, one of the first things we want to try and look at is just get people's views, people on the call, people's views around what product liability is and what product liability entails. Um, um, as part of the session, we're going to look at a definition of product liability. Um, we're going to look at an example and then we're going to see how it links into 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 the supply chain um, as well. So put your answers in the in the chat group, please. Um, just any thoughts on, on what you think product liability means or what it what it entails. We'll just take a minute to do that. Something goes wrong with the product. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Victoria, where the box stops. It's an interesting one. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, injury or harm from a product. Thank you, Camilla. So damage to property or injury to a person from a product. Um, there's no need for negligence um, like PL. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again, Victoria. Taking responsibility for outcomes and effects. And we'll probably take a couple more. OK, um, all very um, correct um, responses. Thank you very much for for the interaction from the uh, from the people on the call. Um, all very correct um, definitions um, and um, aspects of of product liability. 
Um, so just to move into the definition from an insurance perspective. So um, what is product liability? So product liability is a potential um, for a product to cause bodily harm, um, some form of property damage, um, or indeed um, causing a, a financial loss um, to a third party. Now, the most important thing to take away from this definition is, is the third party um, piece. Um, and we'll look at an example that sort of explains that in a, a little bit more detail. But ultimately, um, the risk is inherent um, from, a, from a third party perspective. So as we delve into the the topic of product liability and just to explain it a little bit further so the liability in itself is for injury or damage suffered by consumers and it arises from where a product is is defective so for example um the, the products are manufactured or supplied uh to a standard of safety um that people would generally be entitled to or um or will be entitled to expect um and if that product in itself fails um and causes some form of injury or is damaged then the, there's a liability um risk there the term product itself um covers all substances um, items and equipment manufactured, um, whether it's imported um, or supplied, um, and includes those um, which have been sold uh, on the second-hand market, believe it or not. Um, so duties on the product safety law will apply to all products sold, leased, hired, you know, something that's loaned um, as part of an agreement um, or even given freely um, as part of a trade, um, and it includes uh, electronics um, or, or distant sales. Now, when we talk about responsibility for product liability, the main responsibility for product safety falls on those who produce, um, manufacture or rebrand um, the, the actual product in itself um, and also imported products. However, anybody who supplies goods as part of a trade or business must be able to identify the producer uh, and must not sell any product they know or should know to be defective. So um, if, if you know that the product in itself is damaged, um, you can't you can't knowingly sell that or pass that on to, to somebody else without having some form of li uh, product liability kick in in that effect. Um, so in addition to liability um, on the product safety legislation, um, liability can also attach um, on the contract between two businesses as well. So such as, for example, when one um, company supplies materials and components to the other company um, and owing to poor quality or defects, um, the business receiving the good incurs unnecessary expenses or loss, so that, such as product liability claims, reworking costs or product recall costs. So that in itself starts to paint an image of how the supply chain starts to come into effect um in 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 the event of product um liability um and then the last piece there uh, specifically about the supply chain so distributors and sellers you know they must keep records to trace the origin of products they supply um, there must be a level of traceability within the supply chain all the parties in the supply chain have to take appropriate action including notification when there's a, uh, a requirement of a recall um, should they become aware that a product uh, in itself is is defective so effectively everybody within the supply chain for the supplier product had some level of of of, of liability for the product okay so we said that we'd look at an example um, as part of this uh, process just to sort of um, help explain how product liability works. So if you look at a manufacturer, a manufacturer of valves, for example, so the manufacturer will, will, will make a valve. Um, and in this scenario, we look at a chemicals plant. So the manufacturer will supply um, a valve um, to the chemicals plant um as part of their supplier customer relationship now effectively something then goes catastrophically wrong with that valve that valve causes um a, a gas leak uh, a chemicals leak that then leads to some um catastrophic catastrophic events maybe an explosion a fire 
um, which then goes on to cause um, injury to staff on site, uh, potentially visitors, uh, contractors, you know, um, and it could even be damage to a building that's nearby as a consequence of the, the actual chemical plant catching fire or, or, or suffering some form of damage. Um, and then this obviously leads to uh, property loss um, and a financial loss. So that's that's effectively where product liability is. So the manufacturer in this case um, is is liable for that valve that has um, that has effectively gone wrong or effectively become defective and caused um, an issue with the chemicals plant, which in this scenario is the third party. So that's the key thing to again take away from this is that it's it's the third party, it's the the the, the damage and the defect and the loss has happened at the third party. So products um, effectively come with packaging. So when you think about the valve in itself, the valve would have been supplied in in with some form of packaging, some some form of instruction manual. Um, the packaging itself, um, the valve itself would have had a level of warranty, um, um, and there would there may have been a situation where after sales support would have, would have been provided, um, and then some sort of product information around the valve in in itself, and all these factors and all these um, sort of feeding to 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 product liability itself so it's not just a simple product in itself but it's everything that's sort of associated with delivering that product um to the third party that could become um consequential in a in a, in a product liability situation so it's vitally important uh, to make sure that products uh, are well designed and manufactured so that they're safe and meet the relevant standards um, and legal requirements and th that goes without saying in any sort of scenario in any sort of manufacturing or production environment that that should be the case uh, but more so in, in a scenario or in a situation where where product liability can 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 kick in now we will look at um, we will look at sort of factors um, influencing product liability. So when you think about the product in itself, um, so if we start from the top, so if we look at product lifespan, so effectively in this scenario, when you look, so the different products out there and different products have um, varying lifespan. Um, we have uh, some products that that last a short period of time. We have some products that last a longer period of time. Um, chances are that a long life product or a product that's supposed to last a long period of time, the longer it goes on, um, the more chances are of something um, going on um, with, with going wrong with that product. So that's why we say that product lifespan has a, a huge influence on um, product liability. Then we look at the um, the the next factor there, which is user group. And again, this is all dependent on um, the individuals and the persons that are using the product, because um, effectively people would use the same products in different in different ways. Um, so depending on who uses it and the manner in which they use that product, um, the product liability will be impacted um, to a certain degree. When we think about mass production, so mass production, um, when you think about a, a, a mass production environment, say in, in the food industry where uh, tins of food are, are mass produced um, um, within a factory environment, if something were to go wrong uh, in that sort of environment, say a, a mix or a, a recipe goes slightly wrong, um, in that mass production um, environment, if that mistake or that error is not captured early enough and then you have a situation where you have tons of product tons of end, end product uh, manufactured which are all defective um, thereby increasing your product liability risk so mass production again has a huge impact um, in the event that something goes wrong in in that mass production um, environment geographical sp spread um, again, just as this um, says, the, the the wider the spread of the products, the 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 wider it has to travel, the more um, people are getting involved um, in in terms of handling that product, um, in terms of manufacturing that product, geographical input, um, then the liability uh, of of that uh, of that product, um, the liability risk increases on that product. Um, just just for the inherent fact that there's 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 more involvement and there's a wider spread um in in the use of that product itself um 
The fifth factor there, so product functionality again, um, this again will have um, uh, a huge impact on the product liability itself. Um, so depending on how the product is used, um, in what manner it's used, um, that could have a um, a degree of of impact on on um, on the lifespan of that product in itself. So it kind of ha works hand in hand with product lifespan, and in some respects, user group. Um, so functionality in itself is is key, um, and the definition of that functionality and how that product works um, it makes a huge difference. Um, and then the final point on there is um, complexity and emerging technology. So again, um, when you think about this factor in itself, um, it's it's purely down to how complex the 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 final product is. Um, and again, if the product is something that is emerging, um, when we say emerging, if it's new technology, if it's technology that's still at the prototype phase, hasn't been fully tested, um, hasn't gone through the rigorous um, uh, consumer um, um, aspects of its 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 um, product cycle, then there is more of a risk with that product because it's new and nobody really knows how it's going to work in in um, in in, the, in industry really. So again, that's another uh, factor in itself that could impact. Um, product liability. So moving on to the next slide. So now we start to talk about steps that um, producers, manufacturers, um, and indeed um, importers um, and distributors or retailers can take um, towards managing their product liability. Um, so we'll look at some factors that are specific to producers. We'll look at some factors that are are specific to importers and distributors, and then there, there are certain factors that cut across whether you're a producer, a manufacturer, or, or importer and a distributor. So if you are a producer, um, you need to effectively incorporate um, product liability requirements into your design, uh, into the design, testing, and the manufacture of your um, products using third party guidance. Um, testing and verification where necessary. So this is again just trying to shore up, shore up the integrity of your product and 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 ensuring that that product meets um, its purpose, its design, and it's been it's been rigorously tested um, 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 to prevent any any defects from occurring as a result of that product. Um, so um, you need to also, as a as a producer or a manufacturer, you need to also identify any specific product safety regulations, um, be it in the countries that you that you service or um, or even outside countries that you service. Um, um, so, for example, if you supply products to to Europe um, or um, other countries outside of Europe, um, you need to work to those standards within those countries. Um, um, and the effectively the standards that apply um, to the products that you, you manufacture um, and you 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 effectively sell to those countries. So if you take CE marking um, on electrical components, for example, so since um, the UK um, since post Brexit, um, the UK has developed its, its own standard um, for electrical products marking, uh, which is no longer CE. It's now called the UKCA. Um, however. Um, to be able to sell the UKCA mark product into the U into the into the EU um, um, as a producer, you need to still meet the requirements of CE marking. So you need to effectively still meet the regulations and requirements of a CE marked electronic product to be able to ship it into the EU. Um, so those are just some of the intricacies um, that that um, you have to take into account um, with uh, with product liability. So uh, packaging requirements. So assess the packaging requirements for the product um, against legislation and um, and guidance, um, and ensure that it's, it's suitable, safe, uh, and appropriate. Um, as part of this process, you know consideration should be given to providing um, safety signage um, where appropriate. Um, um, to effectively to the location where the 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 product is, is being sold. Um, Another thing to look out for as well is compliance. Um, so effectively, we need to 
um, carry out ongoing compliance assessments um, and product quality testing as required, um, either as part of quality assurance in production um, or to ensure the product quality and safety um, where products are imported um, or you sell or distribute those products. So this is the first point, whether you're um, when when you're an importer or distributor or, um, or, or retailer. Um, so going back to the point about uh, going back to the point about repackaging as well as a manufacturer, um, if you repackage or rebrand your products, ensure that you identify the risks associated with the products, um, and ensure that the appropriate markings. Again, I talked about the CE marking. Um, ensure that the appropriate marking and the warnings are placed um, on the product um, and the packaging itself. Um, swinging again to the importer side, so if you're an, an importer, or distributor or retailer, um, you should look to obtain evidence again of compliance testing um, and quality control from the manufacturer or the supplier. So the liability doesn't just, um, you sort of need to go back to the manufacturer and ensure that you have all the appropriate details um, associated with the product that you're importing or distributing. Um, um and um effectively when you think about the point of sale um as well um you need to ensure that there is um um you need to ensure that you understand the implications um of point of sale um impact um as well um for the products that you're you're importing or distributing now um factors that sort of cut across both whether you're a producer or manufacturer um or um or a um distributor or retailer of the product um you have to look at uh, traceability um as well um and that's something that starts to become less and less um apparent um when um you have complex supply chains for certain products um and that's where it starts to get quite sticky and quite complicated with product liability so one of the key things to ensure is that you have traceability um and compliance with legislation um across um the products um you have batch identification um you have all that information so that the product can be traced right back to the supply base um, and right back to the manufacturer in the event of something uh, going wrong um, with that product. You also need to manage um, your your records um, um, and ensure that you have every every required detail of uh, and, and supplier records associated with that uh, with that product um, itself. From a product recall perspective, you need to maintain records of products supplied uh, and sold by your businesses um in order that you can have a mechanism for for contacting buyers if you need to make them aware of product safety issues so if there's there's uh so say say you in this in the example that we gave about the valves um there would be need to be a form of traceability back to the valve manufacturer um you need to you need to be able to contact um uh, the customer um preferably the buyer within that customer environment to make them aware of any product safety issues um, associated with the, the valve um, and effectively um, carry out a containment exercise. And we'll talk about that when we link into supply chain a bit further in the presentation, um, effectively carry out a containment exercise um, uh, to effectively ensure that no more defective product um, makes itself, it makes its way out to uh, um, out of the, the marketplace. Um, and the final point on there is about um, getting feedback from the customer. So we need to ensure, organizations need to ensure that there's a method of collating and analyzing customer feedback. Um, so feedback could include um, complaints, um, information around uh, defects of products. So you keep a defect report. Um, and this is ultimately so that the manufacturer um, or distributor retailer can record uh, record information um, and log information and carry out formal investigations um, in the event of uh, in, the, in the event of a defective product being being supplied to the customer. Um, they can also carry out analysis um, on trends um, and identify any potential um, future defects or emerging issues um, and then take the necessary steps and actions to correct them uh, and ultimately 
what they're looking to do in that scenario is to improve um, product safety. Um, and in some cases, it could include a change, a complete change of design of the product um, or a, a, a complete um, 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 restructure of the product in itself and creating a completely new product that's more suitable um, for the consumers. Um, and it doesn't just stop there. There's also uh, a, a, an element of customers working with suppliers, you know, organizations working with the suppliers to address, address any other relevant issues. Um, and in, in more serious cases, um, consider um, what they can do to prevent any sort of future occurrence um, that may that may impact um, or, may, or may cause a product liability risk within the organizations. OK, um, before we move on to the next slide, um, and I think I may have inadvertently answered this question as part of my uh, as part of the the beginning uh, slides. Um, can we just put answers in the chat again, just to get some interaction from people on the call? Um, how do you do? We think that product liability links into supply chain. Can we just give our views or thoughts again? We'll take a couple of minutes um, from people on the um, on the call. Just give their view on how how we think product liability links in. To supply chain. Thank you, Victoria. So understanding reliability and integrity of key suppliers, absolutely correct. Thank you, Alan. We need to be able to trace products back up or down the supply chain, absolutely correct. Thank you, Michael. Um, there's a chain of suppliers and liability flows along that chain. Absolutely right. Do we have any more? Um, if we don't, then we will move on. Thank you for your uh, thank you for your answers. So, um, it's all around it's all around quality. Um, um, because effectively, product liability is around the defect um, um, around a product. So how do we manage the defects and how do we ensure that the defects um, do not have a longer term uh, impact um, on the end product? It's about companies and your organizations effectively bolstering their, their quality. So quality is one of the five golden metrics that are used to measure performance within organizations. So the remaining four are, are total cost, cycle time, delivery, uh, performance and safety, but um, we are we will be focusing on quality um, um, as it relates to product liability liability within within this session. So, quality management within organisations um, overlooks all activities of the organisations that determine uh, quality policies from the implementation of. Uh, um, uh, quality standards such as ISO, um, ISO 19001, TS 16949, um, AS 9000, various different um, um, quality policies um, as it relates to the industries that you work in, um, objectives and respons responsibilities so that the project um, would satisfy needs for which it, it was undertaken. So this is either in a project um, environment or within a manufacturing um, environment within your within your organizations. So quality management generally incorporates four processes. So there's quality planning process. So putting all the steps in place to ensure that your final product is of good quality. Uh, quality assurance. So again, um, this is where we start to link into the supply base and start to ensure that the final product and the end product um, is made to a high standard and that the incoming product is also suitable to, to satisfy um, the end product. Um, quality control, um, again, internal processes, um, looking at ensuring that quality is built in into every step of the manufacturing process. Um, and finally, quality improvement. And as is with any policy or any process within any organization, you always want to strive to continually improve that process and improve that policy. Um, and quality in itself is, 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 is no difference. 
Um, supply chains are tasked with producing high quality products and services on a consistent basis. Um, therefore, supply chain management is an entire exercise in quality management um, it, it itself. So um, a lot of people will think that um, um, quality is not part of supply chain management, but that it, that is not the case. Quality is a huge big part um, of supply chain management um, and um, there are two aspects of that type of quality there's the external quality piece which is your supply base and the supply of products into your into your manufacturing environment and then there's the internal quality so you have an internal quality team um, ensuring that um, the product is made to a high standard um, and then also assuring the quality at the end before it goes to the customer to ensure that the product is free from defects. So you can start to sort of build a picture around how product liability sort of feeds into, into the supply chain. So we're going to look at four different sort of risk factors um, and supplier quality links to product liability. So again, starting to get your heads around how product liability links into the supply chain. So for the supplier chain to exist, um, there needs to be a group of suppliers that supply a product to your manufacturing environment. Um, and your organization has to have a, a process or a means of being able to select that supplier, not just selecting that supplier, but also ensuring that you control, um, you monitor and you control um, that supplier from a quality perspective. Um, also, um, with the procurement teams within your organizations. Um, there's also a requirement to feed into the specification of that product as well. Um, and this is one of the th things that I've sort of pushed on in, in my career, um, and, uh, and this will resonate with a lot of people that work in procurement and supply chain. It's about getting that procurement and supply chain early involvement in the design phase um, of a product so that they can feed in um, um, factors such as um, choosing the right suppliers to work with, um, choosing suppliers that meet the right uh, quality standards, um, um, and also choosing suppliers that will be effectively easy to manage um, and, and have the same sort of ethos as the company itself. Um, and you find that if you get that early involvement in the specification process and the selection process, um, it just makes the the fulfillment of that supply chain requirement by the customer a lot more easier by selecting the right suppliers and specifying the right um, uh, processes to support that end product. Um, testing of incoming goods. Um, I think people will be amazed how many companies out there actually don't do any incoming goods testing on incoming checks on goods um, and you can straight away see why that would um, cause a disruption or effectively feed into product liability risks because effectively if you're not checking the incoming product there is the, all there is the possibility of that incoming product being defective and then going into your final product and then making its way out the door to the end customers um, which which is catastrophic and uh, and and uh, not good for any any organization that prides itself on on good quality um and then the final piece that we're we'll looking at is is just generally general quality controls through having a quality management system in place again previously i talked about quality standards such as uh, iso 9001 and ts 16949 which is prominent in the automotive industry um and a lot of um organizations invest in having a QMS system in place within the organizations. And it's all about, the, the big thing about quality is all about consistency. If you make a product, say a pen, for example, if you if you make a pen, you want to make that pen the same way every time you make it. So that's where your quality management systems come in place. And they give you that consist consistency as, a, as an organization. They help you ensure that each time you manufacture that pen, you manufacture that pen the same way consistently every time um, and guarantee that you made it right the first time, you make it to the same quality each and every time you manufacture it. So let's look at the first step. Let's look at the selection, uh, supplier selection piece. 
So just giving some thoughts uh, around some key requirements um, from a supplier selection perspective. So you want to look at it again, a, com a company that's uh, similar to yours uh, with, a, with a similar quality management culture, quality is built into every stage of the process. Um, and we always, when I worked in industry, we always said that quality needed to be led from the top. So from senior management all the way flowing down through the organization, it wasn't one person's res responsibility. It was a responsibility of everybody within within the organization. Um, you want to work with a supplier that's got suitable knowledge, ex expertise, and, and 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 the right production equipment to manufacture your product. Um, you want to consult. Uh, you cons you want to consult with uh, competent legal counsel. Um, that's familiar with the jurisdiction that you're operating in prior to any agreements. So effectively, this is talking about contract management and going into contract with a supplier as well. Um, chances are you would want to have a clause around quality and, and defects within your contract. So ensure that you get the right legal backing and right legal counsel when you put those contracts in place to protect your business. Um, so no excessive uh, cost or time pressure to develop, um, produce or carry out services. Again, you want an efficient supplier, which effectively means you have an efficient supply base, but do not compromise quality for that efficiency um, as well. Um, effective communication with the supplier that you selected or audited um, and an effective change management system, because one thing that's always guaranteed in a production environment or in a manufacturing environment, one thing that's always guaranteed, and in fact, when you think about it in life, change is always guaranteed in life. So you wanna ensure that whoever you're selected as the right supplier to manage your quality and the quality of the product is supplied to you, that they have an effective change management system in place so that they can manage any future changes, any future flexibility or requirements um, that your company needs, or in fact, they need to do um, within their own organizations. It needs to be managed effectively um, and tracked and monitored um, so that in, in the event of there being a product liability risk or, 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 or challenge in the future, there is a traceability that can go back to that change management process and it can be reviewed and investigated um, uh, appropriately. Um, adequate insurance coverage, um, um, which will resonate with, uh, with my colleagues. Um, adequate sample testing procedures as well. So again, um, within a quality um, within a quality um, environment, you want to be able to randomly sample and test product, and ex the expectation is that product um, will always meet the right quality requirements each and every time. Um, chances are that something may go wrong along the line, but with random sampling and random um, testing, um, then you 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 will be able to catch those uh, challenges and defects. Um, formal recall and crisis management program for brand protection. So say anything goes wrong, um, there is a process to be able to manage recalls. And we see it a lot in the automotive industry as well. We see a lot of product recalls on vehicles. Um, and um, as soon as that happens, there's communication, there's a team that kicks in, that's uh, a specialized team that manages that sort of um, situation and they'll kick in and they'll send out communication and they'll arrange with customers for the recall uh, and containment of, 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 any, um, of any defective product. Um, adequate due diligence uh, for foreign supply chain outsourcing. So again, this just links into being um, aware of the countries that you're dealing with within your supply chain and the countries that you're working in, um, understanding the cultures, the habits, um, ensuring that they are aligned to 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 your processes and your requirements. Um, so do your due diligence when you decide to outsource um, outside of, outside of what is your is your normal home country. Okay, moving into uh, purchasing a specification um, of processes. Um, again, looking at contractual risk uh, transfer, consider geographical um, diversity of jurisdictions, complexity of legal contracts, and the number of contracts um, um, that are required um, with the suppliers they are dealing with. Again, purchasing having a, a very um, high input into this process is key. Uh, they know the suppliers more than anybody else, um, and they know. Um, who they can approach um, that will give the right requirements or will give the, the right form of partnership with the organization. Um, so in addition to that, we're looking at, we're also looking at product warranties, 
you want the right um, supply base that will provide you the right warranties, um, inclusive of limitations of products and services provided, um, and then the necessary warranty exclusions as well relating to, to that product. Um, the use of contract manuals and samples and the contracting process as well. Again, legal um, representation is key for this as well. Um, as well as people are procurement and supply chain experts and not always uh, experts in 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 law. Um, so it's always good to have third party sort of engagement and uh, and inputs into the process um, so that uh, you can be adequately informed when when uh, going into agreements. Uh, document and data retention, again, depending on what country you, you operate in, it's always, it's always slightly different, um, the retention periods, but always follow the policy uh, within the countries that you, you operate in um, and ensure that you have the, the right certificates of insurance uh, with adequate limits of coverage um, from your insurer um, and you review this on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a periodic basis just to ensure that the right, you have the right coverage and the coverage is still appropriate for your business, usually on, a, on an analyzed basis. Testing of incoming goods. Um, so I talked about this earlier and how there are quite a lot of organizations you'd be surprised out there that actually don't do any sort of incoming uh, testing of goods. So this is where it starts to effectively go wrong. So what, what we're proposing to organizations is that they look at setting up um, where they haven't got this in place, or if they do have it in place, again, to check the robustness of their incoming uh, quality and goods assurance, um, ensure that there is a form of acceptance testing when the product arrives on site. Now, people will turn around and say, you, due to resource, due to time, it may not always be uh, acceptable to have, or you may not always have the time to do the acceptance testing. Um, but there's no there's no rule that says the acceptance testing has to be straight away. And in fact, in most cases, it's it happens two, three, a week, two, three weeks after the products actually hit the the the, the warehouses or, or where where the customer receives the product. You always need to ensure that you have um, the right agreements in place with your supplier base to say we will receive this product on a certain day, but we do need X amount of time, X amount of weeks to be able to do the right testing to ensure that that product meets the requirements. Never be in a haste um, because that's when you start to get into problems if you don't do the right acceptance testing on the product that you receive. Um, certification requirements as well. So a lot of um, a lot of products, um, especially in an engineering environment, require uh, require certifications of conformity um, when um, the products are delivered. Um, so from a quality perspective, you always have to ensure that you have those certificates of conformity and that you are verifying those certificates of conformity as they come into 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 your um, into your manufacturing environment. Um, and again, um, there is there is a high risk if you skip some of these requirements. Uh, and I've seen it before happen where requirements are skipped and then further down the line, issues start to occur so there's a reason why these bits of acceptance testing certification requirements are are key and important to, to businesses it they're there to provide the controls and they're there to provide the consistency in the quality um of the of the product you supply um levels of in inspection as well again um due to resource due to time um due to the criticality of the component itself um, what we usually say to organizations is you specify a level of inspection for the products that come in. So you're not going to test everything that comes into your organization. So taking a very lay um, example. So if you had a supplier of MRO and they brought packs of toilet roll to, to your warehouse as, as part of their supply, um, that there, there really be, would be no need to, to test that um, or um, ascertain a level of inspection. Okay, maybe somewhere further down the line, people find out that the toilet rolls are not of good quality, um, but it's not something that's gonna cause a detrimental if, uh, impact um, to, your, to your organization. So you can always retrospectively fix that issue, but depending on the complexity of the, of the product that's coming in, you define um, a, a, an appropriate level of inspection um, that's a, that's, uh, that would meet the requirement for that product. And then quality documentation as well, um, as part of incoming QA, 
Um, quality certs should always be specified where appropriate and where necessary. Um, so you, you have a product that hits your shop floor and then you have the associated quality documentation um, to, to support that product. Um, so in the event of there's something going wrong, you've got the qualification, you've got the documentation, sorry, that matches that product and you can always carry out your investigation or, or, or look at your your traceability as well. And there's a lot more detail involved in each of these um, aspects. Um, but we're just really just touch it, touching the surface of these requirements and how they link into, into product liability. So you have effectively um, received your, so you selected your supplier, your supplier supplied a product to your organization, you effectively received the goods into your organization. Um, supplier quality control talks about ongoing um, um, work with the supplier to improve their quality. Well, first of all, to measure their quality performance to yourself as an organization um, and to work with them to improve that quality um, where that, that quality in itself is, is, is poor. Um, and there are various ways of doing this. Um, depending again on your organization, you can use a, a parts per million um, type quality metric um, for your suppliers. Alternatively, you can use a disruption score. So how many times has the supplier supplied defective products that effectively means that you have a disruption to your production line? You can use that as a, as a KPI for measuring your supply base. Um, and um, you can also use uh, a non-conformance process as well. So a way of effectively measuring how many times a supplier supplies a defective product, um, but it doesn't actually make it to, to the final product because you have uh, an effective internal control, quality control process that stops that to defective product from from uh, making it onto onto the line, and the purpose of supplier quality control is really a um, is really a, a circle loop of feedback to the supplier and um, challenging that supplier to be able to manage their processes, manage their manage their quality to ensure that they aren't supplying you um, defective product. Um, and then when we think about internal quality as well, so we talked about supply chain and the external quality within the supply base. Now we're talking about internal quality. So how do we start to look at our internal quality, quality management? How do you start to look at internal quality management of your organization? Um, so again, as we talked about in terms of the quality uh, processes, we talked about quality planning and control um, and having a comprehensive method of doing this within your organization. Um, um, having full documentations, um, uh, full documentation control and a record retention um, um, policy as well, because it's very, very important in the scenarios of product liability that if somebody comes, if, an, if someone is doing an investigation call, calls for that documentation that relates to that product, we need to be able to supply that um, documentation for, for investigation purposes. Um, also have standard operating procedures in place. Um, many a time you walk into the shop floor, you talk to uh, an operative on there and they say, you ask them, oh, how are you, how are you um, attaching that door to that vehicle? Um, and they say, oh, well, I do it like this. And you ask them, show me the procedure. And it's like, oh, I've always done it, I've done it like that for the last 30, 40 years. So I don't need a procedure. But say that person moves away from that role and you bring somebody else, into that role and you assume that that person has the right skills, um, you need a standard operating procedure that kind of defines and standardizes the process, irrespective of tribal or historic knowledge from a shop floor operator. You need to invest in, 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 in the SOPs that ensures that, again, it's all about repeats, repeatability and being able to make that product the same um, every time. Um, employee training goes without saying, and ensure that you're, you, you've got the right and uh, suitable skilled employees and labour. Um, ensure your employees are familiar with quality management procedures and processes that you have in place. Um, audit programmes or follow up findings, so internal audits. In addition to internal audits, you also audit your supply chain as well. So um, again, if there's a resource constraint or resource challenge within your organization, maybe you look at setting up a, um, a, a critical supplier list and then you, you audit your critical suppliers, maybe on a more periodic basis than you do some of your less critical suppliers. 
Um, and then a regular review um, of um, uh, and updating of procedures and processes. Again, it's an iterative process. Nothing is static. Everything has to be dynamic and ever changing to meet your your business needs and your organization's requirements. Um, again, internal quality and control. So in addition to the management system, internal quality control, um, look at uh, process control and statistical sampling um, again, just to see because quality quality professionals tend to work with a lot of data um, that shows them trends um, related to the product um, that they uh, that, that they're dealing with. So by statistical process control and sampling, you can start to look at and review trends on the quality of the product that you manufacture. 100% um, testing on critical features um, of single devices, um, automatic controls in mass production, um, state of the art equipment um, or outsourcing of critical tests. So again, depending on the business need, you either do it in house or you outsource to a supplier. Uh, documentation, as we mentioned before, uh, regular ma maintenance, be preventative or um, um, either present preventative or um, following on from a, a, an issue or concern, but usually we we like to promote that you do preventative maintenance on your on your equipment, um, and again statistical sampling of of uh, and controls as well. So tools like Six Sigma, uh, zero defects, parts per million I mentioned earlier, to ensure that you've got the desired quality levels. So in summary. Um, we need to understand product liability risks in your organizations and your supply chain. Uh, determine your high risk suppliers for potential uh, quality issues. You develop a qual supplier quality assurance process to include audits and incoming quality assurance. Um, and finally, um, the intent is to review your internal quality and controls to ensure that they are effective and, and they meet the requirements of your organization. Thank you very much. Um, that brings an end to the webinar. I'm happy, happily take any, any sort of questions, comments, views. Yeah, so yeah, if, if anyone has any questions, please put them in the, the chat or, uh, or you can raise your hand and come on screen if, if you want. Um, I, I was just wondering, Namdi, when you were speaking there, I suppose you, you mentioned things like people not doing testing when they should do and things, but what, what are the main barriers or challenges that kind of stop people from implementing these processes? Because they're probably all things that we should know we should do, but they don't happen for whatever reason. Is, is it because of culture? Is it because of time? Is it lack of resource? What's the, what, what are, what's the issues? Yeah, one of the main one of the main things I have certainly seen um, from working in industry is purely down to resource um, and cost management. So um, rather than hiring um, an individual or a person that will manage that incoming QA process, mm -hmm. um, they've tried to fan out that responsibility to various different people within the organization um, or within the within the process flow or supply chain flow. Uh, and you know what that, what that causes, Alan? It causes a situation where it's everybody's job, nobody does it, and mm. yeah, it, it effectively falls down. Um, and it's yes, so primarily where I've seen it go wrong is, is primarily down to down to uh, down to resource and uh, cost management. Okay, yeah, yeah, because because I mean, there's a lot there. If if you're looking at that, what you've talked through there is a comprehensive system of how to manage quality there's a lot of things there so you can easily see why why things might get might get missed um camilla has put a quest thanks camilla we've put a question in the chat um can you have rights of recourse in any type of products what contract clauses would we expect to see in the supply of raw products that's a it's a very good uh, uh question camilla um i think ultimately when you think about the supplier role, so you have your various, um, you have your natural, um, your standard contract clauses that you put in place um, around cost quality um, delivery. Um, and in terms of raw material, it's uh, it's a different, it's a bit of a difficult one because ultimately what you're, what you're trying to do is you're trying to put in a clause within your contract that effectively says if anything goes wrong or defective with that raw material, then the liability sits with the supplier. Um, of that product. Um, so ultimately, um, you, there's nothing, you can't take it any further than that other than 
asking for liability and um, of that raw material to sit with that um, liability of the defect of that raw material to sit with that um, to sit with that supplier um, of that of that product. Um, chances are that it's not going to go any further because it is a raw material. But if that supplier, if because sometimes when we talk about raw material, it's not always in its rawest form. Sometimes there's there, there could be another layer to that raw material. So if I use an example, say say a supplier supplies headlights to to the car industry, for example, um, and the car industry would would the car manufacturer would class that headlight as a raw material. However, to the supplier, that's not really a raw material because there are elements. There's the tungsten filaments. There's the there's the light casing. There's all sorts of features. So it's about taking it down to the granular level and ensuring that your contract can capture as much of that granular level as it can to reduce liability. Um, but it's always a difficult one, um, but it's case by case. You know, you need to look at it into in, in, a, in a level of detail. And it's, so is, is this then where you're sort of risk, that upfront risk assessment of identifying your sort of higher risk or higher, the, the parts or materials that are more likely to cause you issues down the line, if you identify those things, then you can start to be a bit more robust around the, the yeah. contracts or clauses that you put in for those parts. Absolutely, uh, yeah. absolutely. And I talked about, um, you know, I talked about emerging technology because it's a bit more difficult if it's new technology, if it's brand new technology, because you don't know how it's going to function. So you don't, usually with legacy product, you will have a, a raft of information that ha has told you where things have gone wrong with that product in the past. But if it's brand new emerging technology and that becomes very difficult because you don't know where it's going to go wrong you don't know where the quality is going to be challenged and and, and just 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 quickly because i'm conscious of time but uh, camilla has asked a follow-up question about you can do that for food products too like milk or tea leaf etc so the kind of yeah real kind of raw materials i suppose commodities even yeah i mean ultimately it's about when you talk about the food industry because food industry is about all about how you move that food product from point a to point b so with the food product is less about liability on the the actual product itself but it's more around liability on how that product is delivered to the end customer so it's like transporting it to prevent contamination um ensuring that when it gets to its end user um it it hasn't um you know because food needs to be transported in some in some cases under under temperate conditions ensure that you've met those requirements whilst applying to your your um, um, but yes, you can always put a you can always put a clause in there that just ensures that that product comes to you in the right in the right in the right um, state. So, yeah. so it's, 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 it's about the transportation and how it's been handled from the, the source, if you like, yeah, rather than. OK, um, so th thank you. Thank you uh, for everyone uh, for participating in your questions. Thanks, Namdi. Um, we will send just a copy of the slides that were used. Um, you can uh, we'll include a link to our YouTube channel if you want to subscribe to that and you'll be able to view the, these again at some point in the future if you want to. Uh, or you can get in touch with us uh, via the, the email address there as well, the zrs.inquiries at uk.zurich.com. Uh, other than that, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for coming along and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you.